Hi everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. If you've had a Dogman Encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to help support the show by becoming a premium member, please go to dogmanencounters.com backslash podcast to sign up. Memberships are only $2.99 a month. By becoming a premium member, you'll be able to download episodes onto your mobile device and listen to them commercial-free wherever you go. Also, if you'd like to check out the new Dogman Encounters t-shirt store, please go to dogmanencounters.com backslash store and take a look around. Buying a t-shirt or sweatshirt there is another great way to help support the show. As always, thanks for listening. Alright, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest has a dogman problem. If you listened to episodes 190 and 191, you heard Brandon Close talk about the first time he saw a dogman in the huge woods behind his property. Well, he's had another series of encounters, and that's what he's here to talk about tonight. Brandon, thanks for coming back on the show. Hi, Vic. Thanks for having me again. I appreciate it. Well, thanks for coming back. We appreciate your time. Brandon, for the people who haven't listened to episodes 190 or 191, please tell them about yourself. Well, to briefly touch on that, I've got about 192 acres out in Cato Meridian. That is more of a northern central New York area. It's Cayuga County. And I've got my house located within about five people on the entire road and they're miles apart. I do a lot of hunting, fishing, and splitting wood. I'm out in the woods a lot. Ever since I was a very, very young child, before I could even hold the gun up, you know, I was pulling the trigger and the scope and shooting squirrel, shooting woodchuck. And it got to the point where I've really gained a love for and a respect for the animals. I'm not going to shoot or kill anything that I don't plan on eating unless it's a nuisance animal the damaging crops, things like that. I have a family, a wife and a daughter. I go to work, I come home, and uh, we're actually in the process of moving right now. And uh, I'll get into that a little further. After carving out such an idyllic life for yourself and your family, it sure is a shame you have to deal with this dogman problem. But of course, we're going to talk about that in just a bit. How long was it after we spoke last time before you were able to comfortably go into the woods behind your home? Well, Vic, that was about March, April, May, June, July. This encounter happened last weekend for more than a day. It had been a few months since I had another issue. At that point, if anyone's listened to 190 and 191, you would remember that I had had an issue in the woods with my friend Gene, who also has a small part in this next story. And <clears throat> there had been a situation where we had had a lot of cattle at that point, which I don't have anymore. There had been some scratching on the house. My wife had called me. She'd been worried about some things. The dog was not going outside. I decided to go out and check into the woods. You know, long story short, I ended up stopping about two miles, maybe three miles into the woods down a dirt road, shining a spotlight up onto what I had heard crashing through the woods on the right side of me and seeing the hand in front of the tree originally and the two amber eyes sitting in the buggy with all the lights off and I see one, two, three, four fingers. And then there's a fifth finger. It's not a thumb. It's a fifth finger. And at that point, that was my first encounter with a dog man. And at that point, again, to keep this kind of brief, because it's already in 190 and 191, it jumped across the road up in the air, landed on the other side. We tried to take out of there. My friend ended up shooting it in the chest, ripped its pectoral muscle. It backed off. Again, it came up for us. I'm on the way out of here in the buggy, 
it put its hand up on front of the left driver's side light and started to slow us down. My friend put the gun up to the window again, and I'm looking out and seeing this creature very clearly, a creature that I knew to not have even existed. And the creature has quite enough intelligence to know that this is the object that had created pain, and it backed off. The motor stopped bogging out. We took off. We got on the road, got back onto the street, got home. After that, there was some very highly ranked, unbadged military officials. The markings I've never seen before, if any that were anything anyone would be familiar with, they ended up showing up. I talked to the sheriff. The sheriff came through. He linked me with these guys. He said, they'll take care of you. They ended up coming up. They had a machine with them that looked like a satellite disc, about 12 to 15 inches wide, and a smaller one similar to that behind it, smaller in diameter, and it had a gun with a trigger on it. They pointed it out that way towards the woods when they showed up in this all-black vehicle, uh, van slash truck looking thing. Squeezed the trigger. My dog went nuts. I couldn't hear anything. My dog could hear it. She was having seizures. She was foaming at the mouth. I started screaming. He put it back down. They stopped. Uh, at that point, I could tell that was some type of a weapon that they would have used to disable this dog man's ability to mobily move forward with whatever it is that it needed to do or whatever its intentions were. And at that point, it had been a few months. They came, they went out, they came back. They didn't tell me much, and they left. And at that time, I went to the edge of the woods and took six or seven of the memory cards I went to look for in my deer cams, trail cams, and they were missing. They asked me a lot of questions. Do I have anything on camera? Can we look at this? Can we look at that? And after a matter of months, I slowly got back into the woods. It took about three months. and. As I've went through trail cams, every single one of the trail cams, other than three of them, the memory cards were gone, and those three did not have anything on them. So I would assume that they'd taken them, which if you know how much those cost, they're not just a dollar. So that was frustrating to me. I tried to get in contact with them. I spoke with the sheriff, who's a family friend. He didn't give me any further information. I would assume that he stayed in contact with them throughout this episode, and they really didn't give me any further information. The only thing that I knew was when they came back, my deer cams were not working because I needed to put new memory cards in them. And at that point, when they left, they said they would call me. They never did. March. April, May, June, no problems. I'm back out splitting wood, cutting down trees. There's no problems. And up until that point, I hadn't had any issues just until last weekend. And that's when things started to get really bad. Yeah, I'd say they did. Since you've got so much to tell us about your recent experiences, I want to get right into it. Please tell us about them. Okay, well, it was last weekend, Saturday night. I had been feeling at this point that I'd prevailed, not thinking much about the situation anymore. It had been a matter of months, and what I've gained from you and what I've gained from everyone in the comments on such a positive note, and if I may mention Stargazer, she is very, very supportive. And she has also helped me out quite a bit. Very, very frequent flyer with Dogman Encounters. And uh, I just feel that she really deserves some type of notification because she has been very supportive with everyone. And I know that myself, as well as other people, are very grateful for her level of support outside of yours. So starting with that, it was last Saturday. And I had actually been sitting around the house. I wasn't 
really doing too much. I had just went out. I have three cattle left, and they're almost like family pets at this point. I went out, saw them, and uh, talked to them for a little bit like I normally do, fed them, went around and checked them out. Everything's good. Started coming back inside. I get in, and it's time for bed. Had dinner, had some nice uh, venison steaks. Brussels sprouts, corn on the cob, green beans. I like my vegetables and I like my venison. So we get in and it's dark by now. And I'm just putting my daughter, Gianna, call her Gia. I'm just putting her to bed. And she's taking a little bit longer than she normally does. Nothing out of the ordinary. Sometimes that happens. So I'm singing to her and I'm rocking her back and forth. Let my wife do the dishes and get dinner cleaned up, and I'm upstairs with my daughter. I get her to bed. We both meet up in our bedroom, and we're kind of just watching TV like we normally do before bed, talking about what the plan is for tomorrow, you know, what we're going to get done, what needs to happen. And what I've got is a two way baby monitor, and this isn't just a vocal type of baby monitor like you know I used to have back in the day. What this is is a Motorola and what it is is I set this in my daughter's room, which we're on the second floor. My daughter is on the bottom floor, who's at the bottom of the stairs. So through Wi Fi, how this works is I put this small cell phone looking device next to our bed. It shows a screen on the front. It's in color, it has noise, and it has video. It reflects exactly live what's going on in my daughter's room. Noise, color, video. And if any noise is made, anything is happening in there, I'll know immediately. So we're just going to bed, and I hear what sounds like some type of feedback on the radio, on the two-way camera. And I look over real quick, and I kind of see her rolling around. And I said, okay, well, she's I better not go back to sleep. She's probably going to be up in a little bit. This is about 2 o'clock in the morning now, 1 o'clock in the morning. She's probably going to be up in a little bit. I'll have to give her either another bottle, which normally if I give her her oatmeal bottle. She'll go right back to sleep because she's got some teeth now and she's eating whole foods. You know, I give her her little mush carrots or or whatever it is, but I'm thinking to myself, I better not go back to sleep because I think that I'm going to have to go down there. And my wife did the dishes and got everything cleaned up and she cooked dinner. All I did was put my daughter to bed. So I'm going to be the one to have to get up here. So I kind of lay down and roll over. I'm all snuggled up, and I hear some type of, uh, it sounds like cards falling over, I guess you could say. If you were to have a penny taped on the end of a normal playing card, and they were lined up like dominoes, and you had five or seven of them in a row, and you were to touch the first one, how they would fall over and how the penny would hit the ground or the table would be what the noise was making. And I'm, okay, well, what is that? Some type of feedback. And I look over at the screen on the monitor for my daughter's room, and I look at my daughter, and the first thing I catch in my eye is these two amber-colored eyes and these hairy ears and the snout. This is a dog man. This is right outside my daughter's window. Her bed is directly in front of this window, which is downstairs, an entire flight of stairs down, an entire floor down. I look at this camera. Through the camera, I see this dog man in the window. I go nuts. I'm scared out of my mind. My heart's pounding. I grab my pistol, I get out of the bed, 
Immediately, my wife wakes up. What are you doing? What are you doing? I run downstairs. As soon as I run downstairs, I'm trying to be as quiet as possible. I don't remember at the time, even though it was a matter of days ago, I don't remember if I was being as quiet as I possibly could have. I would like to have think that I was. I don't know if I was because of the adrenaline rushing through me. All I thought about was getting down there as quickly as possible because I don't want this dog man reaching through the screen. The window is open. You crank the crank and it opens at a 45 degree angle. I don't want this dog man reaching through the screen, grabbing my six month old daughter and pulling her out of the screen. I'm watching this on my camera. I'm seeing this dog man outside the window and I see this grin on its face. My fear is that it's going to grab her and it's going to take her out of the window, smash its claw through the window and pull her out. I immediately grab my pistol and I go downstairs, what I think is quietly. I get down to the door and I smash the door open real fast. As soon as I do, immediately I'm looking into the window. For less than a second, I see him. I see the same type of dog man that I had seen previously in the woods with Gene. The tall ears. The tassels at the top of the ears, the snout sticking out in front of it, its bright white teeth. Its mouth is not open. Its teeth hang freely on each side of its mouth. This creature doesn't have to open its mouth to reveal its teeth. I have had more than one encounter with this creature. I'm starting to slowly, slowly get more familiar with it. I open my daughter's room, which only has a nightlight in the very corner of Tinkerbell, mind you, so it's pink and white. And I see this pink and white reflection bouncing off of the screen, which also has a shine to it. And I see the dog man on the other side of this. And all I could do at that point was yell, ah, and, and, and scream. At that point, now I've got my wife up, now my daughter's up. Dogman immediately ducks down, and he's gone. All I could see was from his left and right shoulder, from the lower part of the neck up, I could see his snout, his teeth were hanging out, his ears were sticking up, and I could see the tassels on top. That's all that I could see of him. Now, mind you, this is on the first floor, but this window is nine feet up in the air, okay? This is not a window that's on a lower portion of the house. I measured it. If you were to have looked through the window as this dog man was, you would have to be eight and a half to nine foot tall at your shoulders, which was exactly where he was. So I'm going to assume that he was nine, almost ten foot to the top of his ears. So at this point, I see him drop out of the picture. He's gone. I have my pistol pointed at him. He disappears. I run over. I grab my daughter. I come back upstairs. Now she's crying because the door, when I kicked it, swung open. It bounced off of my foot. And if you ever know what those little L brackets are with the big screw in the bottom that you put on the back side of the door so that when the door comes all the way open, if you've got kids over there opening the door, The lock or the door knob itself doesn't go into your drywall. That way you don't need to continue to fix your drywall if the door is open and the knob goes into the wall. So it bounces off of this little button, this little L bracket with rubber on it, back to me. I hit it with my arm. It bounces off, comes back, and I guard my arm with it again. I go in, I grab my daughter, and I go back upstairs. At this point, my wife's saying, what is it that's going on? What are you doing? Why do you have your pistol? Is this happening again? And I said to her, I'm not going to lie to you. I just saw what I saw last time when Gene and I were in the woods. 
She got very upset. She was very scared. I was very scared. I didn't know how to approach this. This is my second time dealing with this creature. I'm not a professional. I don't know the details. I have a lot to learn. I have absolutely no clue what my next move is. I don't know. So we have a discussion on how it is that we think we should deal with this. My daughter is sleeping in the very middle of the bed. My wife's on the left. I'm on the right. We have a fairly large California king bed, and it's very difficult to touch each other, even if we're all sprawled out. So you won't wake up if somebody kind of bumps into you, anything like that. But I always do have my dog, Maya, who sleeps at the very end of the bed. She's a black and white pit bull. Gets along great with my entire family. Never any problems. Extremely protective over my daughter. But she always sleeps at the end of my bed. I have a level of security with her here. I won't even let her sleep downstairs. I have her come up here. She enjoys it. But if something happens, there's noises, somebody hits the front door, something's going on, she will immediately jump up. It'll wake us up or she'll bark. She'll let us know what it is that's going on. At this time, because I only saw this dog man through the screen that was on my daughter's baby cam, she wasn't able to be able to see that. So I had to do what I had to do to move forward. I only was aware of that as I looked onto the screen. So now I'm at the point to where my wife and I are having a conversation of how this is back. What do we do? At this point, we know we're not calling the police. We know how that was dealt with the first time. The police came by, they belittled it, and all of a sudden they sent over this group of individuals who's paid by some form of the government that doesn't have any name, and they claim that they dealt with it. Well, I thought that they did, Vic. I did. Because it had been a matter of months, and I hadn't seen anything, no issues, no worries. I'd actually gone back into the woods. I'm in the woods at dusk. I'm in the woods in the early morning. I've moved forward, and I've been able to gain that back over a matter of months. And now I see this dog man looking and staring at my daughter, six months old, on the lower floor, through the window at two o'clock in the morning, and I'm watching it on the baby cam. That's a very scary, scary thing. At this point, we have our discussion, and I say, we're not going to involve the police again. We know how that goes. We're not going to call other people and ask around like we did last time. We're not doing that. What I'm going to do is take some preventative measures and be able to ensure that I'm on top of things to be able to protect this place and be able to actually be on top of what it is that is going on because last time I was completely not in control and I was basically manhandled when it came to what it is that I needed to do. I didn't know what it was that I needed to do. I had no clue. So I'm thinking to myself, my wife and I have had the discussion. I'm going to stay on top of this. I'm going to be alert. We're both going to be aware. The cameras are all on outside the house. Everything's going to be fine. The day goes by. I don't go to work, obviously. The next evening comes. I do hay that whole day. We don't really discuss it too much. But I end up finishing, I'd say, seven to nine wagons. And basically what happens is, I don't have anybody that stands into the wagon and waits for the bale to be thrown and then stacks the wagon. You know, you're only going to fit maybe a couple dozen more. Listen, I got one guy, me, driving the tractor. It's bailing them. It's throwing them into the back 
it is what it is. Then I get it back. Then I have a couple guys take it out. They throw it on the elevator. It throws it up through a hole that's about three foot wide and about four foot tall in the top of my barn. And that's the hay mile. That's where I've got somebody at the bottom loading up the elevator, throwing the hay on. And I've got two guys in the top of the mile who are stacking it nicely. So I get that done. We finish up for the day. And my buddy tells me, hey, I got to go back home. I got a couple things I need to do. I said, fine. He goes, you're going to be okay finishing this last wagon? I said, yeah, man, absolutely. So he leaves. I go inside and I say, well, I got the rest of the night to finish this. It's about 7 o'clock. I got to go in and grab something to eat. So I go inside, and what I've been doing lately is cooking some squirrel in the pressure cooker. The bone falls right off. I've been making a stew with it. It's phenomenal. So I was very excited about that. That's what kind of drew me away from finishing the full day's job and going in and eating because normally you're not getting me to do anything else, not even use the restroom until I'm done with my job. But I'm telling you, this pressure-cooked squirrel stew, Vic, I wanted it, and I wanted it now. So I went in, and I had my dinner. I went inside, and I kind of hang out for a little bit. Now I'm thinking to myself, all right, well, there'll be a little bit of dew in the morning, but I can finish this hay later on in the morning. And I sit down with my old lady, and we're watching a movie, hanging out. And it's about nine now, and it's starting to get dark. It's been starting to get dark. And I said, you know what? I got to go out and I got to finish this. There's about 67 bales left. I can knock this out real quick. I'm going to go out and I'm going to go finish it right now. So I had a couple cold beers and I went out to go finish it. Now the barn is about 150 yards away from the house. It's an older barn. So I'm going to walk out there and I got the wagon right in front of it. I got the elevator pointed right in front of it, and I got the elevator pointed up into the top of the mile so I can get that loaded up. And what I'm thinking is I've only got 60, 70 bales left. I'm going to chuck them all up there. Then I'm going to get up there, and then I'll organize them. Then you get them stacked. That's how you do it if you're with one person. So I get out to the barn, and... I'm about to get this haystack, and I hear some type of rustling around. Now, as I go into the barn, originally how the barn had been was there was one rail on top of this sliding door, and there was one rail on the bottom. And basically, you couldn't get over it into the barn with the tractors, the four-wheelers, or whatever it was without hitting that rail, that bar at the bottom, where the wheel was at the bottom of the door, to be able to slide it all the way over to get in and get access to that barn because it would bend that every single time and then the door would get stuck. So what I did was I removed that bar. Now I've got the complete door hanging from this one bar, this one rail that's on the top and it's got two wheels on it, one on the front top side left of the door, one on the front top side right of the door and it hangs on that rail and that's how you slide it left and right. So I go to grab the door and I slide it, slide it to the right, open it all the way. And at that point, I hear some type of scuffling around in the back, but it's on the top. I'm thinking to myself, all right, well, there's raccoons in here again. Man. So I got my pistol and I'm thinking, perfect. I'll be able to pop one of these guys because they're a nuisance animal. And I said, I'm going to come over in the corner here. And I'm going to wait. So I come over in the corner a little bit. As soon as I do, the middle area of the barn where the cattle, if it's really, really bad outside, I bring them all the way under the barn where the ground is kind of halfway dug out underneath. And they have almost like horse stalls that I put them in. And I step over that and it creaks really loud. And then that noise stops. So I wait, and I look up, and I think this is going to be another animal that I'm going to eliminate because it's a nuisance animal. 
Now, this is an old barn. It was built a very long time ago. I would not be able to accurately give you a year, anything like that. But basically, when you look through the pieces of wood, they're anywhere from a quarter inch to a half an inch apart. So as the sun is setting, this is at the end of the evening, you can see light shining through this barn through these pieces of wood that make the barn up. And I sit for a little bit and I wait. And then all of a sudden I hear the rustling in the corner up top in the further corner of me, which is about 25, 35 feet away, directly above me, directly in front of me, 35 feet or so. I hear it. And this sounds much louder than I would expect any small creature to be. And I hear, boom, 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 boom. And as I'm hearing the sound, all of my senses are heightened. My hearing, my sight, everything. And I hear, boom, boom, boom. And I'm looking up at probably a 70-degree angle in front of me. And I can see the light shining through the middle of these boards, which make up the old barn structure. Dust is falling between these boards as this creature is stomping above me, but in front of me. Boom, 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 boom. I hear it creaking, stomping. This is an extremely heavy being, whatever this is. I have no clue what this is. I can hear breathing like a smoker or someone that's out of shape. (sighs) (sighs) Boom, boom, boom. It's getting dark. There's light shining through between these planks, and I can see the dust falling above me, and the dust is falling closer and closer and closer to me. And I can hear what almost sounds like some type of a horse, just (sighs) that type of noise. And I crouch down real low, real close together in the corner, and I take the safety off. And I've got this thing pointed to the ceiling. And I'm waiting, and I'm waiting. And as I look through the crack, I can see part of the shadow and part of what I think I can see. I think I can see these. Have you ever seen the bottom of, like, a dog's foot? how it's like a broken up pattern of what looks like very dry skin. That's what it looked like. Just very broken up type of cracked skin. And immediately what I'm thinking is, dog man, I unload. This is not like me. I unload this pistol. Boom, 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 boom. As soon as I get the first two shots off, I don't even think I get the first two shots off through the floor of the ceiling, which is the roof of where I am on the first floor, this thing immediately retreats. Boom, 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 boom. And I hear it running over into the corner and it stops. My heart's pounding. I can hear it beating into my ears. And I said, I'm not doing this again. There is absolutely no way that I'm dealing with this again. I turned around, and I immediately load another clip, and I come up the ladder. Now, I reach up on top of me, and I'm pulling hard. My body is shaking. I'm pulling up onto this ladder to get through the small hole that puts me on the second floor where the mow is, where I stack the hay, and where this thing is. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm not getting my head ripped off. I've heard stories of how these things reach down, and they hide. When you come out of your door, you hear (laughs) knocks on your door. And then you open your door and you stand out there. They're on the top of your roof, Vic. And they grab you by the top of your head and they rip you up back up on the roof. You're gone. I'm up on the ladder and I can feel the splinters ripping into my fingers as I'm pulling up this ladder. It's about 12 to 15 feet. I get up there, the first thing I do is I put the barrel of that pistol on the very last step of that wooden ladder, which is on the bottom of the floor to where the mow is up there, and I point it. I slowly push my head over the top, and I look, and as soon as I do, I didn't even get to get a shot off. What I see is 
a dog man, what I know is a dog man, crouch down in the corner through the area where the hay comes in. It's a small window, which is about maybe four foot by three foot or so, or vice versa. It's where you put the elevator so that you can get the hay bales, the normal, not the squared, not the round hay bales. You don't throw them up there. The square hay bales from the wagon onto the elevator up into the mow, and you have a guy or two stack them. I see this thing grab around the corner. He reaches onto the edge of the window. He looks back at me, and I see this, and at that point, he waited for a second. And I'm thinking to myself, and I, and I say he because I'm going to share later how I know it's a he. I'm up to the very top of this ladder, which is the bottom of the mow, which is the top of this floor, the second floor where this hay goes. The first time I've had this encounter, the immense fear that I felt, this primal fear where I would have done anything to execute this creature where I would have done anything to eliminate this situation. My perspective on this being in general was it creates fear. It wants you dead. It wants to scare you. You are not at the top of the food chain anymore. And as I climbed up that ladder, I felt the splinters ripping through my hands. I've got my left hand every two steps on the ladder. And I can hear my gun that's in my right hand, my pistol, clacking on each one. Click. Reach up again on the left. Reach up again on the right. Click. And I get all the way up to the top, and I see this thing crouch down in the corner. It's pulled away from the corner now. It's about to jump out the window. I'm in awe. We're face to face again. The same dark hair. Completely jacked muscles. Big, long arms. He is much further away than he needs to be from this window for his arms to reach. His fingers, all five of them, he has no thumbs, are wrapped around the edge of this window. He's ready to pull himself out. His ears are laid all the way back. I'm used to seeing them straight up from the first encounter. What this creature emitted emotionally to me was an intense amount of pain and sadness. I felt like I had just killed one of my family members and I had done nothing. Imagine you coming in and ruining a surprise party for your family. Imagining yourself in a situation where somebody had waited their whole life to save up money for a special car that was their dad's favorite. And you went up to him and you go, hey, so-and-so just got you this car. I know he's going to surprise you in a little bit, but that's what's going on. Or when you'd be in a situation to where you've stolen or lied or cheated to somebody that truly cares about you. You've hurt somebody on an immense level. That is the emotion that I got when I've got this gun pointed straight at its head. I could have pulled the trigger. I'm not saying that this would have eliminated this dog man. I had him dead to rights, right through the front of my pistol to the back. 40 caliber, Vic. I had it right on his eyeball socket. He knew it. I got the most upset sadness. I felt there was no light, no love, no objects, no nothing in this world. Nothing existed that was positive anymore. Nothing was worth anything. Every ounce of energy on an emotional basis that you've spent pushing forward to be the best version of yourself has meant nothing. You're nothing. What you've worked for is nothing. You have done nothing. You as an energy are nothing. And I couldn't pull the trigger, Vic. He looked so sad, the way he portrayed his emotions to me. And I feel at this point, this is how they communicate. Through not telepathy, but almost an emotional level of telepathy. Feelings, emotions, that's how they communicate. 
I couldn't do it. I felt like I was hurting someone that I've loved my entire life, and I couldn't squeeze the trigger. He got away. He took off. I sat there for about 20 minutes. Part of me wanted to make sure that I could hear him leave, and I could. Landed on the ground. I heard him bipedally take off. And it's almost dark at this point. But there's still some light from the sunset. I heard him take off, and then I heard him going through the cornfield. I heard the husks of corn just... And I heard them fade away. And at this point, I'm thinking to myself, what did I just do? I just gave him a freebie. He just tricked me. Or did he reveal himself to me? Oh, my God. I have finally learned how to defeat this creature. Now, I've got a cockiness. I'm in my ego. And I'm thinking, I don't have to fear these creatures. Look what I've done. We've shot him the first time. Now he's came back up again. I had him dead to rights right in front of me. And he was scared of me. And I let him leave. Now I'm feeling like, you know what? We as a society, we as humans, didn't climb to the top of the food chain this whole time to eat leaves. Now I'm feeling on top. I'm getting a little cocky here. So I go inside. This is about 30 minutes later. 15 to 20 of it, I'm sitting there, head just over the top of the bottom floor of the mow, and my gun still pointed out the window. I don't know what's happening, but I feel defeat at its expense on my behalf. I'm in a positive mindset. I'm thinking to myself, this is great. I've done it. I can't wait to share this with someone else who doesn't know how to defeat this creature. It's an emotional standpoint. Prove yourself. I've got it. Boy, was I wrong. I left the barn, and I walk back inside, and I've got this tremendous amount of pride that I'm feeling. I feel that I've found out what its low point is. And I've done research, and I've never heard of it doing something of this nature. Little did I know, it was playing me. And I was soon to find out over the next two nights how it was. I let it take advantage of me by it letting me think I was taking advantage of it. This is an extremely intelligent being we're dealing with here. There is not a normal level of animalistic type of thinking. This creature has studied or been aware of or been around or at some point had a part in human emotions like a professor. It's scary. I went back in the house. I explained to my wife, this is what happened. I did see it. She goes, don't tell me that's what I think it was. And I said, it was. It was on the top of the haymow. She said, I heard all the shots. What is going on? I said, I shot through the floor. I didn't exactly know what was going on. All I know was I saw the pads of its feet through the cracks in the top of the ceiling, which was the floor of the mow. I saw the dust falling through. I heard the level of weight that consisted when it walked, boom, boom, boom. And at that point, I unloaded. Now, I wouldn't be able to give you accurate information if I was to know if I hit this creature or not. But by the time I got to the top of that ladder, I saw it and it emitted such a sadness like the entire world was over and everything you would ever hope and dreamed of was ripped and stripped from you. I feel I prevailed on a mental state with this creature. And I almost had a intention of like a, a notion of bragging to my wife. He's gone. He's not coming back. I dealt with him. You don't got to worry about that anymore. It's done. We're not calling the police. We're not calling these secret people. It's done. So we discussed it for a little bit. And to be honest, I didn't want to have too much of a discussion. So we discussed it on a very short basis. And we lay down to go to bed. Now, at this point, 
my daughter's upstairs with me. She's sleeping again between my wife and I. It's about one thirty in the morning, and I jump up. My dog immediately shoots up, boom, and she sleeps under the covers near my feet. So I can't see her. All I can see is the cover pop up, boom, and it's about two foot tall. So I know she's up on her front legs with her back legs down, and I can see a sheet, a blanket in front of me, left, right, and she's looking around. And I'm like, here we go again. What's going on? At that point, I hear something banging around. It sounds like the storm cellar door. And I remember I was moving wood down through the storm cellar door earlier that day. And immediately a level of fear came over me. And I thought, I didn't lock the storm cellar door. Now I'm scared. I lost all that ego, all that pride, all that cockiness is gone. It's 1.30 in the morning. My daughter's to my right. My wife's to my far right. My dog is to my far bottom of my feet. And she is awake, aware, and on point. And I know that I didn't lock that storm cellar door. So I get up immediately. I grab my pistol again. And I slowly walk down the stairs. I wake up my wife. She said, what's going on? What are you doing? And I said, stop, stop talking. She's trying to have a discussion with me. What are you, what are you doing? What's going on? And at that point, with adrenaline, with the situation I'm in, her not knowing what's going on and me knowing that I left an opening to my house for this animal to get in. I don't speak to my wife this way. I have a very large amount of respect for her. If anybody wears the pants, I'm going to be honest with you. It's her. But at this point, I looked at her and I said, you need to shut up. Stop speaking. And she looked at me sideways a little bit, but she did because I don't ever talk to her that way. It was very rude, but in the heat of the moment, I didn't know how else to get her to stop because if I would have said, can you please just stop talking? She would have said, no, I don't think so. What exactly is going on here? And I couldn't have that because I was trying to listen. So I, I, I was a little bit rude unintentionally, and I also apologized for that afterwards. Sincerely apologized. And she does understand the nature of the situation that Things happen the way that they did. No hard feelings. It is what it is. So I grab my pistol. I go downstairs. I see her. I look back as I walk out the door. There's stairs that go down to the left, about 15 stairs. There's a two by six foot area, three by six foot area where it's the bottom. And then you take another left. There's about another 12 stairs down to the first floor. When I get to the doorway, I look back at her and she shakes her head, and she grabs my daughter and puts her on top of her stomach face down. Now they're face to face, stomach to stomach. My daughter's hands are over each side of her face on her shoulders, and I see both of them together. And immediately I'm thinking to myself, something is in my house. Let's make an executive decision and think about, has there ever been anyone as a human being in your house? No. Do you have any enemies? No. What have you done recently that you're familiar with to the extent of where you would think that it would be something that you could plausibly put into that theory? Dog man. My heart is racing. I can hear the heartbeat in my ears. I look at my wife and my daughter. Daughter's sleeping. My wife's awake holding her. And I'm looking in her eyes from 20 feet away at the end of the door, about to go downstairs, thinking, She's giving me that look like, listen, you're that guy. You're him. You need to do this. We don't have time to call police. We don't have time to call mom and dad. I'm 31 years old. I'm a grown man, Vic. It's time to handle this. This is family business. Get it done. I hear rummaging around downstairs. I start to go down the steps very slowly. And I mean very slowly. As I'm slowly stepping down the stairs, I've reinforced these stairs, but I can hear them creaking. You know, that, err, and every time I step on one, I stop hearing this. And it sounds like somebody is shaking some, uh, I want to say almost shaking cereal. That's what it sounds like. 
And, I, and I'm like, what the f- is this? So I go down a little bit further and another creek. I wait. It takes about almost three minutes for me to hear this sound again of this rustling around downstairs. I get down to the first floor. I look around. I don't see anything. I don't hear anything. I wait. I've got my gun in front of me. I always leave my basement door open because we've got the basement, the first floor, the second floor. And I've got decks off of the bedrooms on the third floor, which is the top floor. So I like to leave everything open so, you know, heat rises and cold air sinks. I like to keep the fan where I work out downstairs, which is a concrete type of finished basement where I put a lot of extra freezers, fridges, and there's an old cistern that's down there. And for those of you that don't know what a cistern is, basically about a century ago, a cistern would be a maybe 10 by 10 or 8 by 8 or 6 by 6 blocked in concrete and cemented in area about 6 foot tall that would hold the water for your house. That's where you would get your water from. So basically what I did was I knocked a two and a half to three and a half foot doorway out of that small square. And now that we get our water from a well, what I did was I knocked that out. I put about two to three inches of number two runner crush at the bottom, which is about two to three inch small square rocks, about two to three inches, maybe four deep. And I put the water softener on top of that. I put a filtration system. It removes all the impurities, things like that. It's all the way over in the corner when you walk down the stairs into the basement, all the way forward. That wall is in front of me. And that's on the other side of that wall is where I have all those things for the water. So I sit there for a little bit and I sit at the top of the stairs and I'm listening and I don't hear anything. And then I hear If anyone's familiar with what it sounds like for a car to pull in a driveway that's a stone driveway or someone walking on a stone driveway, that's what it sounded like. And immediately I knew there's only a small area in this basement that has stone. And I knew that something was in that corner on the other side of that wall. I can kind of see that the storm cellar door was closed. But the door to the basement before those five steps that go out to the storm cellar door was cracked open. So I could see the light from the moon. Because if you remember, if you're from the area, last weekend was a bright night. And I could see it crack through there a little bit. And as I get down there, again, I didn't know how to handle myself. And I knew that something was in there. And I knew that this was some type of a creature other than a human being. And immediately what my thoughts go to is dog man. So I kind of come around the bottom of the stairs a little bit and I try to look over the top. And what I think I see is this thing, this hairy thing crouched down with its arms almost flat on the ground, crouched right down to the ground and its nose almost down to the ground. And I'm like, okay, I know what I'm seeing right now. I know this outline. And I screamed again. Ah! And I'm like, I'm, I'm going to rush this thing. That's all there is to it. It's me or them, and it's going to go down now. So I run up to this thing. I didn't even get two steps. This thing reaches out its arm. I see it extend it. Now, from its elbow to its shoulder, it looks like a normal human length. From from its elbow to its wrist, it's an extremely extended portion of its arm. I see the the fingers, the nails, and the light that's shining through. It rips this door open. I hear it bounce off the, the, the wall. Boom! And I hear it run up and out of the house, up the stairs, and I see the silhouette. I see the ears. I see the body, but it's very crunched. It's very smushed down but I can see the hairs on it and I can smell the disgusting smell of wet dog garbage. And like, um, if, if you're sweating and your clothes have moisture or rain on them, this is what the smells like. And I see him go up the three or four stairs, whip the door open, boom, boom, boom. 
goes up to the top and I'm thinking, okay, I'm not going to shoot. I'm downstairs. I'm in my house. We're not doing this. Goes up out of the stairs and I hear the bipedal noise again. <laughs> Takes off. So I stand there for a minute. I don't know what's going on. So I slowly walk over and I feel like some type, it sounds so stupid. I feel like some type of an agent. I run up to the corner and I'm, I got my gun up facing to the ceiling and I quick point it over to the side again. And then I run over to the other side, point my gun up, point it over to the front again. Like I'm some type of spy or agent. I probably looked like an idiot, but he's already gone. At this point, I go up, I grab my door that closes like a mouth almost, and I pull it down. I put the two bolt locks, I slide them out, slide them up. Now both sides of the storm cellar door are closed. I come back down, I shut the main door to the basement. I go over and I shine my light because there's only one light bulb that's down there right now. I click that on and I see pressed down doesn't look like legitimate dog footprints. It just looks like almost rectangle with points on it, about nine inches to 10 inches long, which could have been longer with the nails. But I see them and I see the corner of that area where the cistern is, where I have all of the rocks pressed down in the corner, like there was an extreme amount of weight in that area. I never pushed or hand tamped those stones. So now I know what's going on. I know what I saw. I go back upstairs again, and I'm thinking to myself, I need to tell her the truth. I go up. I talk to my wife. It's now, I would say, 2.45 in the morning. I tell her I saw what I didn't want to see down there. I chased it away. It's gone. And she said, was it what I think it is? And I said, yes. And she said to me, and I'll never forget, Vic, I've been with her for a very long time. We've never had any issues. No, uh, you know, drama, cheating, and, you know, drunken going out here, not coming back on time, nothing. We've been great. We may be annoyed by the way each other chew our food, but we've never had an issue with anything like this, and she looked dead in my eyes when I got back up to that bedroom, and I grabbed my daughter off her and held her close to me. She looked straight in my eyes, and she said, if we don't move, I'm leaving you. And that really hit me hard. This creature has put something on my family Maybe in the olden days, they'd have called it a curse, but that's not what it is. I've never seen this type of demeanor from my wife, such a level of untrust and insecurity. And I made that decision right then and there, and I said, okay, we'll move. We're done. Now I'm giving up 192 acres. My family's left me. Splitting wood, having cattle farming, having my own property to hunt on, when the person you care about the most in your life looks at you and tells you that you've been given an ultimatum, and if you were them, if you don't have the strongest love for that person, and they don't reciprocate that strongest type of love, you're going to stay. And I couldn't. So I made the choice right then and there. And I said, that's fine. Give me a week. We talked a little bit about it, went to bed. I was agreeing on moving, and I thought that everything was done, and I had no idea what I was getting into. And this is when it really started to get serious, because obviously now he's in the house, which is a huge thing. I've never dealt with that. And also, which is another huge issue, there's also two of them now, and I've never dealt with two of them. So these are the most serious parts of my encounter. We still have a lot to talk about, Brandon, but we're out of time. Would you mind coming back next week? I can absolutely do that. Good. Well, you know I'm looking forward to it. 
Thanks so much for coming on tonight and sharing these experiences with us. We'll just have you come on next week and have you start off where you left off tonight. That sounds great, Vic. And I appreciate the opportunity because where I was at the point to where I thought that this was over, my wife had said to me that we need to move. And I made that decision to move. And I didn't think that I was going to have any other issues. That's when it really started to get serious. And I didn't ever think that I would have one of these creatures in my house. Well, you can't be faulted for that. Why would you ever think that they would come into your house? Well, let's wrap the show at this point, Brandon, and have you come on next week so we can talk about this in more detail. That sounds great, Jake. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thanks so much for yours and have a great night. You too, Vic. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. If you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.